okay, this part is going to be quite different in uh, content performing. Uh, this is not about the past, this is about the present the future. Uh, this is about uh, my take on how China is using uh, diplomatic and media pressure to try and advance uh, its policy aims in the South China Sea. Um, change of title is simply that uh, enemy work uh, is a Chinese uh, military term uh, which is uh, particularly deployed against uh, in the Taiwan context but also elsewhere as a means of uh, uh, targeting particularly uh, people on the militaries in composing sides. And I realize that actually the term political warfare, uh, which is another term that's used widely in China, is more broad and probably describes what I'm talking about a bit better. But essentially we're talking about the same thing. Um, and I, I put this quote from everybody's favorite uh, Chinese military philosopher Sun Tzu up simply because I think that provides the overall context for what I'm going to talk to you about. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. Okay? And I think you need to bear that in mind uh, as I'm talking about uh, the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, and just this morning, as this morning, I acknowledged my debt to a number of researchers. I need to do the same thing this afternoon. So there are two people in particular whose work uh, I uh, admired and relied on in developing this. Uh, so Australian uh, peer to in fact, called Andrew Chubb, uh, who has an excellent website at southseaconversations.wordpress.com. Uh, he speaks, I interviewed him in Beijing over the last year, and uh, he really changed the way I uh, was approaching the subject. Um, he speaks excellent Chinese, he analyzes the language and the motivations of people commenting on security matters in the Chinese media in a way that I don't think anybody else has done and has drawn some, some great conclusions. Uh, I found myself really having been spending two years looking at this um, and trying to make sense of all the, the different views coming out of China uh, and what China's real intentions were. And when I spoke to Andrew, it started to kind of make sense. So I acknowledge a strong debt to him. And, and Jessica Chen Weiss has also written some interesting stuff about how China uses uh, protest and dissent in certain contexts uh, to advance its foreign policy goals. So, a lot of us have heard recently the uh, extreme nationalist, jingoistic language at times of what we call the hawks in China. Uh, these are people who appear regularly in the media uh, espousing fairly hardline views, um, threatening the Philippines, threatening other countries uh, with extreme measures, and um, generally talking about the possibility of war. And the question is, um, if one takes the view that China is not about to launch a war, and you also accept that the Chinese state media is very tightly controlled. Certainly, the mainstream television, CCTV, and uh, other parts of the China Daily, uh, Global Times, these are clearly very strongly part of the state control. Why is it that these people are allowed, not just allowed, but obviously given a platform to point to such strong views? So there's some of them in these quotes you may have uh, come across, but a pair of sounds of cannons in the South China Sea, when these towering oil drilling platforms become flaming torches, who will be hurt the most, so far on. Referring to Vietnam, the Philippines, and Japan, the three running dogs of the United States have just killed one and bring the others to heal. And unfortunately, you know who one is. Um, and then someone else saying, I can send several dozen fishing boats and will destroy the US's latest so these people are given regular platforms uh, in the Chinese media and they say blood curdling things at times. So why is that? Um, a few explanations have been advanced as to why this 
hawkish point of view is given such prominence in the Chinese media. Um, and one is that this is evidence that the Chinese government is under pressure from, a, from the grassroots. You know, that there's, there's a strong swelling of nationalist feeling in the grassroots in China, and that this constrains the government's actions, and so it must present a strong face to the outside world, otherwise it risks losing credibility to the outside world. Uh, another uh, idea, conclusion that people have drawn is that there are hardliners within the People's Liberation Army, and they are pushing to take over uh, either military or state policy, and that they form an organised bloc that can get its views heard onto uh, into the Chinese media, and that they are using that power to really try and push the policy agenda of the Chinese government in a particular hawkish, militarily strong direction. Uh, a third argument, and a third conclusion that's been drawn, is that uh, there exists a degree of irrationality within the People's Liberation Army and leadership, um, and that uh, it might, in the right circumstances, do something crazy, you know, you might start a war, you know, occupy an island, really kind of blow up the Chinese uh, state's overall policy of peaceful rise and diplomacy and uh, take, take control of uh, the foreign policy agenda in a particular moment. So you might do something out of control uh, of, the, of, the, of the Communist Party leadership. And then the fourth one is that just the general idea of instability in China is always a good way to remind foreign governments that the Communist Party is a force of stability in China and that uh, you know, there's always these pressures on the society, so don't try and undermine the uh, Communist Party in case of, you know, be careful what you wish for. Don't push the democracy agenda too far because these major nationalists might take over the country. So those are four conclusions that have been drawn from the simple fact that these uh, hawks are often uh, heard in Chinese media and what that tells us about Chinese politics. But I want to put all of those conclusions under a big question mark and say, is that really what's going on? Uh, in fact, I want to argue that if you think any of those four things, that is the deliberate result of political warfare. Okay? There are people within the Chinese state structures that want you to think that, and then they deliberately set out to create an agenda to make you think that. Okay, and I'll try and prove my case. We're beginning with an example. May 2012, Scarborough Shrill, kicking off as you can see on the date here, 10th of April 2012, when the uh, Filipino Navy and the Mongols. Uh, intercepted uh, Chinese fishermen uh, making off with vast amounts of shells and fish and other things from the sky and shoal. Um, but as you know, things didn't go as planned. Um, so the boats were seized on April 10th, and then there was a Chinese response. Um, uh, Chinese, in effect, Coast Guard vessels came and blockaded the Filipino vessels, and in effect, over the next few weeks, Forced control over the, the, the shoal. Um, but what happened, it took a long time to build up, but um, a couple of weeks after the, the initial incident, the Chinese media started to ramp up the rhetoric. Um, and I think it's best to say that the, the first one that really kind of got to the living was uh, by Major General Luo Young, um, who in an article wrote that the Philippines has fired the first shot strategically, basically sort of saying, you guys have pushed us to it, you know, whatever happens next, it's your responsibility. Okay? Starting to talk about the possibility of some kind of military response if the Philippines was going to attempt to um, try and recapture or regain control of um, Scum Patrol. Okay? But then there's a little lull. And then on May the 8th, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs calls in the Philippines ambassador in Beijing and gives them the traditional dressing down that 
but then makes a point of publishing the text of that dressing down uh, in the Chinese media for everyone to see. Uh, and then the same day, uh, Chinese Central Television, CCTV, uh, warns Chinese citizens in the Philippines of the risks of uh, dangerous violent protests um, taking place in Manila on the following Saturday. Basically, it's the same. Uh, don't go out and Chinese citizens in the Philippines should go out. It's going to be dangerous anti Chinese violence. Um, and then the same day, uh, the Global Times, which as many of you know is regarded as a very hawkish newspaper, although I think that's sometimes overstated, prints an article which says uh, there's a it will be a miracle if there is no conflict in this case. So you can see a sudden ramping up of the rhetoric on the question of Scarborough Shoal. Now what I haven't been able to do is to sort of map this onto exactly what ship was doing what at what time. And I think if I was able to do that, it might be that there were sort of naval movements and things taking place out at sea maybe gave the Chinese some concern that maybe the Philippines was thinking about you know, some kind of operation to, uh, to try and uh, maybe take a shot or something like that. Moving on to the week. So they're following on. So the, the story, the warning of the protests in Manila, uh, it becomes the top story on four of the five uh, Chinese news websites. Uh, the following day, the Thursday, a Chinese TV reporter is allowed through the Chinese naval blockade on the Scarborough Shoal and his uh, films themselves planting the Chinese flag on the shoal and, uh, and that report is aired in the Chinese media. And obviously he wouldn't have been able to do that if the military had not transported him there and facilitated him with his journey through the blockade. Uh, <coughs> and then finally on the Friday, uh, Chinese media carry reports that the southern military region of China has been put onto a war footing and is ready for action. Interestingly, it's not the Chinese media that says that, but the Chinese media quotes Western news reports that the southern military region has been put into a war So obviously the Western media was somehow tipped off that they has gone into a war for two, and then Xinhua, the Chinese news agency, reports the Western reports and then uses that to amplify the message. Okay? And then uh, there were some protests on the Friday, but on Saturday, you know, the, the, these nationalists announced that they're going to hold uh, a protest in Beijing against the Philippines' actions uh, in Scarborough Shop. There they are. All of them. Okay? So, if you think what a nationalist protest in China has looked like in recent years, when they're talking about the Singapore Daiyodai Islands, yeah? You imagine, you know, the rioting, the burning down of Toyota car showrooms, thousands of people on the streets when it comes to the East China Sea. When it comes to the South China Sea, that was all turned up. Okay, five people. Okay, and then they were quickly moved on top of this. So we have this paradox. Why did the Chinese media spend four or five days ramping up nationalist pressure and rhetoric about? South China Sea, West Philippine Sea, Scarborough Shoal, um, and yet when it came to actual noise on the streets, they clamped down. They didn't give permission for demonstrations to take place, and the few people that didn't bravely turn up were quickly you know, pushed away by the police. There's something strange. Okay. How can we explain it? Well, here's a couple of a few thoughts that might explain. Um, at the time this was happening, there were two major uh, scandals and controversies taking place domestically in China. Uh, at exactly the same time as Scar Patrol, you have the blind dissident Chen Huacheng seeking asylum in the American embassy in Beijing. And in contrast to the very large discussion of Scar Patrol, you get almost no discussion of Chen Huacheng in the China. And so shortly after Boshi Lai has been sacked from the Politburo, and that's obviously a major political corruption scandal taking place at the top of the highest level of Chinese politics. So maybe this was simply a way of diverting Chinese popular attention away from uh, more domestic and sensitive concerns. That's how we're doing a foreign crisis to divert attention. Perhaps more generally, they want the Chinese government wants to show, the Communist Party wants to show 
that the government party is sticking up for Chinese rights against foreign intervention. Okay, so they're just basically there to show a uh, flying the flag, um, you know, look how good we are. Or maybe, kind of going back to the previous slide, this is about impressive foreign audiences. It's about showing the Philippines, look, all this pressure that the government's under, we've got to act, we can't back down. Um, uh, you know, then let's get our way into Garden Shore, in fact. Um, could be all of these things, a uh, combination of all of them. And to be honest, it's probably something of all of that uh, in the information. I don't think it's one or the other. But the question is why talk up the issue, but then squash the protests? And I think the answer is simply that. Uh, in general, the Chinese government is very wary of street protests, doesn't know where they're going to go. So it would rather not have street protests. Sometimes it has felt that it can manage the protests, allow them. Um, there have been particular incidents, you know, when you think of the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade by the Americans, when you think of the protests against the Olympic flame in 2008 when it moves through the, London and other European countries, uh, and obviously the uh, the Japanese islands more recently, they have allowed street protests and then very quickly to close them down again. This time they didn't even really allow the protests. Uh, I think that's because they just don't want street protests and then they really go. Um, but essentially we have to explain why the hawks were being allowed to talk up uh, the possibility of Chinese military intervention at the time. So let's look at it. So Reuters, uh, a news agency, described a group of about 20 military officers, uh, this is a report um, and they're very, they are very prominent. If you watch you know, discussion programs and things, uh, if you see uh, op-ed articles in newspapers, uh, some of them have uh, Weibo and you know, Twitter-like accounts, you know, where they put things on there. Um, they are prominent and they are regularly used as pundits and discussants. Now, some people just do, I you know, dismiss them as it's irrelevant, it's just a bluster, it's just uh, people um, uh, who don't actually have much power uh, shooting their mouths off um, because they because they just feel important. And it is true that none of the people that I'm about to talk about, none of these courts, have operational commands. They are all based in military academies and think tanks. But the interesting thing about them is that they almost all have close personal links with military intelligence. And that, I think, is the key to what's going on here. So let's look at a few buttons. Okay, so here is Major General Wu Yuan. He was the person who I mentioned before who talked about the Philippines having fired the first shot when it came to Scarborough Shoal and my implication in justifying whatever Chinese military response China might decide to, uh, to deploy. Um, now, he's not an outsider. He's not an irrelevant figure. Okay? Um, he is the son of the party's former intelligence chief, Guo Jinchang. Okay? He has a direct, personal relationship with the highest levels of Chinese military intelligence. Okay? He's based on the Academy of Military Sciences. Um, his picture was taken outside a meeting of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is the sort of an advisory body as a front organization which gathers people together to advise the party leadership. Um, he's also well known for being very outspoken. He's talked about fighting a people's war at sea, for example. And I think jokingly once suggested that the uh, disputed islands with Japan should be turned into a target by the Chinese to bomb them. Slightly tongue in cheek uh, comment, but it uh, had an effect, and it suddenly drew attention to him and it kind of suggested uh, that the military was thinking of taking a hard line response uh, in, in, in cases of you know, desperate measures in, in cases of the islands in Japan. So, um, and in um, September 2012, uh, the day after the, uh, if you remember the origins of the Sekako Dotai, Island dispute, the, uh, the right wing mayor of Tokyo was threatening to buy the islands and, uh, you know, as a, a nationalist gesture, and then the Japanese government you know, brought them over his head um, and then 
quote the, uh, the response. And him, uh, this guy, uh, wrote an article in the PLA's newspaper in which he said that China will take all necessary measures to protect its sovereignty. And that phrase, all necessary measures, is usually taken to mean military action. So that was picked up. Um, not just in the article it was written, but it was used all across the state media. CCTV used it, China News Service used it, China Radio International used it, the PLA's own newspaper, PLA Daily, all used it. They all gave this comment, all necessary measures, a big publicity push uh, in the days uh, immediately after the Japanese nationalization of the islands. So they were clearly coming from, this isn't dissident talk, this is clearly coming from Okay. Here's another one, uh, Air Force Colonel Dai Su, um, also somebody who's based in the academy, spent his entire career in what's called military political work in Chinese Terminate, uh, Communist Party, political mobilization of the military. Uh, he's the one who said, uh, I think about the three running dogs, we need to kill one and the other to walk into the So, you know, military action against the Philippines, Vietnam, Japan, will fall into line. Um, he's, a, he's a big blogger, um, he's always he's got some um, different outlets for his different political views, um, and he also operates under a pseudonym. He's been writing as a man called Long Pao uh, on certain occasions, and later admitted to be Long Tao. Um, and Long Tao is connected with this organization, the China Energy Fund Committee, about which I will talk in the next slide. But a bit more about Dai, I mean, he's always, he, you know, he started off his political life in the, uh, the PLA Air Force Political Academy um, and then kind of worked his way up through sort of political parts. He's never been an operational person at all. Um, so, but what's interesting is that he, in his, some of his interviews, he's always stressing the need for political discipline and the need for the Communist Party to retain control of the military and this kind of thing. That's his kind of main agenda. Now, I don't know much about his biography, and I can't tell you if he has any personal uh, political, so personal family connections to the intelligence structures. But he does have an interesting connection through this China Energy Fund Committee. So he writes under the pseudonym, or has been, for this organization, the China Energy Fund Committee, which is run by this guy, Ye Jianming. This guy you may recognize as uh, Henry Kissinger, in Mount Kerbal. So, Ye Jiangming is the kind of person who gets to meet Henry Kissinger from time to time. Now, Ye Jiangming is the former, I'm not entirely sure, is the former deputy head of the Shanghai branch of the China Association for International Trade and the CAIFC. Okay, so you get that? Where it's a little trade, making a trail of connections. So Long Tan writes for this uh, organization, which is headed by him who used to work for this organization, right? We're taking a, a tour around the Chinese inside the world. Now, the CAIFC is thought to assume to be a front organization for Chinese military intelligence. Okay? Uh, a professor at George Washington University, David Shambor, basically said that it was under the uh, overall control of the uh, general political departments, the liaison department. Okay. Not only that, but Ye himself is probably, we don't know exactly who he is, he's either the grandson of the former head of the PLA Navy, Ye Fei, or possibly even the son of the former director of the Navy, the Department of Ye Zhang. Uh, so he is the son, possibly, of the former head of the Liaison Department, which is at the epicenter of Chinese military intelligence. Okay? So now we can see a direct connection between the Air Force contender, uh, Colonel, and this guy, and military intelligence. Okay. We mean the people like Los uh, I don't have the skills to really kind of go delving around in Chinese military intelligence. Uh, another one, uh, Major General Zhu Chengdu. Okay? Um, He's well, he's best known if he says on the internet, so in an interview in 2005, he threatened the US with uh, nuclear weapons uh, if they ever tried to attack China, a uh, remark that was uh, picked up and broadcast around the world. And he too has family connections, 
the grandson of Marshal Judet, the founding commander-in-chief of the People's Liberation Army. So, uh, military aristocracy, if you like. And also, uh, a researcher in the National Defense University. And also, a member of the board of the China Association of International Friendly Contacts, which, as I was just studying, is the front of a front organization, the Chinese military intelligence. So here's our third book. Okay, and here's another one. Admiral Zhang Zhaozhong. These are none of these are multiple figures. You know, if you turn on Chinese media and watch it for an entire week, you'll see these people. Okay? Um, here at one point called for a blockade of all the Philippines military outposts to try and force it to crack down. Um, He's described himself as a military man trained by the party, a person who always obeyed the leaders of the Central Military Commission, the party, the way that the party controls the army. Um, and has, also has a think tank job as deputy director in the New York National Defense University Logistics and Technical Equipment Research Department. Sounds a bit dull, but it's more exciting than it sounds. Um, he's talked to us, you know, the United States would run like a rabbit if China goes to war with Japan. He's the one who talks about sending fishing boats um, to destroy the American advanced warships. Um, but the point is, um, I have a personal family connection with him to intelligence, but he's always, uh, he's very, in his comments about himself, something he always stresses is how he follows the party line, basically. He's, he's quite open about that. He's not a maverick in this sense. Uh, another admiral, um, uh, he was fairly early on uh, in the Scarborough Shoal crisis on the 8th of May. He advocated violence if the Philippines should try and retake Scarborough Shoal. Um, he said if, you know, if it's occupied by military means, we have reason to respond with force. We must take, must take violent action, and it's our right to take such action. So he was clearly being very hawkish in the Chinese media around the time of the Scarborough Show incident. Uh, he does have a family connection, son of revolutionary hero, uh, Major General Yin Yang. Okay, another one, personal family connection to the military aristocracy. Also a member of the Chinese uh, Committee um, and was given the title of Executive External Propaganda Expert uh, by uh, the then director of the General Political Department, the Intelligence Department, the GNA. Okay? So I hope I managed to convince you that these forks are directly tied in to the nerve center of Chinese military intelligence. They are not random voices. Okay? So why are they so common? Okay? They're not just slipping their voices in a dissident way into the media, okay? They are part of the mainstream media discourse um, in China. Certainly the state control media, okay? They give a regular platform. Okay? On one hand, they appear to incite nationalist anger. They talk up uh, the need for China to be militarily strong. They talk up the threats to the country. Um, but at the same time, we know uh, from general awareness of what happens in China that the Communist Party is always nervous about what happens in the street. So there's always a balancing act, stoking up the nationalist anger, but keeping it under control. Okay? And I would follow Andrew Chubb's argument here that these people are playing a deliberate political role, both inside the country and outside the country. And we shouldn't take what they say at face value. Okay. Um, so, this is the part of their political purposes of the slide I've shown you earlier. They have a foreign orientation. Okay? They're trying to convince people in the Philippines, people in Japan, New York, Vietnam, Washington, all of these things. Yep. Try and say, uh, we're under pressure to act, don't push the Chinese government around, um, you know, we might do something crazy. And that's a view that's being deliberately created uh, for, for purposes I will talk about. At the same time, they have a domestic role. And some people might argue that their domestic role is at least as important as their foreign role in the sense it's about conferring the legitimacy of the Communist Party. Um, they're mobilizing domestic support with the Communist Party through uh, patriotic education. 
uh, some of you are be too young to remember the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989. Um, others, like me, were doing their final exams at the university right now, so secondary exams at the university right now. Um, but in the wake of the unrest in China in 1989, uh, the Communist Party had to find new ways to uh, protect its legitimacy, cement its position at the top of China's politics, and they instituted a patriotic education campaign in 1991, which was about you know, trying to mobilize the people, get behind the leadership of the Communist Party uh, in nationalist terms. Um, so this talk you know, feeds into that quite clearly. Um, it can also be a safety valve for frustration. You know, talking about war, talking about foreigners is safer than having people talking about uh, frustration, counter-revolution, all that kind of stuff on the streets of China. Uh, so just this kind of just being able to get stuff off your chest and wave the flag might be a way of kind of managing dissent and dissatisfaction within China. Um, Another thing that's been mandated by law, this time since 2001, is national defense awareness. So this is something that the education system and the military are supposed to do, is to, you know, to mobilize support for the People's Liberation Army, for the military, among the people, through awareness of national defense issues, the threats that surround China, the struggle by the military to protect China's interests, and that's also probably part of what these courts are trying to do. Um, and I think a long time ago, the Chinese establishment realized that in the old days you could have internal propaganda, external propaganda. You could have one set of messages aimed at the people and another set of messages aimed at foreign, the foreigners. But these days, under what they call informatized conditions, i.e. under you know, the internet and the communications being what they are, there is no division now between what you tell the people and what you tell the foreigners. The foreigners are reading the local press, the, the people are and see what they're saying uh, to foreigners. And so therefore, uh, stuff you do domestically affects uh, what you do uh, overseas as well. And the two obviously part of the same thing these days. So, I think there are, all of these things are probably true. Okay, the, the reason the hawks are talking like this, are being used in this way, is for all of these reasons. Uh, and it's hard to pick out which one is the, which one is the most important. I think there's a worry that people take the hawks, hawks literally and seriously. Um, and I think this is the risk. Um, you have three groups of people, <coughs> including the hawks themselves, who like the hawks. Okay? So you have the hawks who kind of like the sound of their own voices, they like putting out these particular messages. The international media love them. Yeah? As, a, as a working journalist, it's fantastic when you get people saying kind of outrageous and those things because it makes headlines. Yeah? It kind of shun, you know, it stuns the world you can have. China threatens war. And you know, people will watch your television program or buy your newspaper. Whereas if you have uh, China uh, votes to uh, continue discussions in the subcommittee on uh, extraterritorial affairs, okay, that tends not to fill quite so many headlines. Um, so the international media love the hawks. And the American hawks love the Chinese hawks because it then gives them plenty of reasons to spend money on aircraft carriers and to you know, bolster their political position in Washington. And so we are, I think, at great risk that you know, people will take this stuff seriously and will end up with a kind of vicious spiral because then the American hawks will respond, you know, we've got to take a flight to China and the international media will love that too. And we'll get, yeah, Americans threaten war on China and then we'll keep going around and then we'll get worse and worse and worse. Um, so we need to kind of take a step back and take a reality check. I'm not trying to convince you that nationalism is fake. Uh, but it's clear from uh, the protests uh, against the Japanese uh, nationalization of the islands that there is political uh, anger uh, among many people in China. Um, the fact that there were no protests on the South China Sea, on Scarborough Shoal, doesn't necessarily mean that the Chinese people don't take it seriously. Uh, Andrew Chubb uh, amazingly managed to get uh, some questions uh, on these issues inserted into a consumer opinion poll uh, that was conducted in five major Chinese cities. 
So they were, they were asking things, you know, like what kind of shampoo do you use and that sort of thing. And uh, market research companies allow people to sort of buy questions in, uh, in market research surveys. And amazingly, you got people to, uh, you know, to answer questions about what they thought of these China Sea and South China Sea as well, which meant he was then able to correlate it with age and education and location. Got some quite interesting data. And interestingly, compared to, say, on the East China Sea, 60% of the people said they were they paid close attention or very close attention to developments in the East China Sea. It's not much less in the case of the South China Sea. It's only it's 53 percent and more than half the population. So there is an awareness and understanding and interest in the Chinese population on the South China Sea issue, but it doesn't result in the kind of scenes shown there, which are the protests in the East China Sea. Um, and I think that's probably explained uh, in a difference in the history. Uh, and also Chinese people know or, or are taught very firmly how much China suffered at the hands of the Japanese during, before during the Second World War, the story of the Nanjing Massacre, etc., etc. So there is a sense of personal violation there. Whereas I think in the case of the South China Sea, it seems much more abstract. We're talking about basically uninhabited islands. There is this sort of more diffuse sense of national territory being violated, but it's not quite so. Uh, and so therefore the passion is maybe missing. But there's an interesting story here. This guy here, his name is Li Juwei, who was one of the first people uh, to give himself up after the uh, sync up of the protests in 2012. Um, basically after the, after the police lost control of some of the protests, you can see him here kicking in a police van. Um, they, Chinese media took photographs of people, um, publicised them, and said they were going to arrest these people. He was one of the first people to give himself up. And the story, he, he then was uh, presumably obliged to give an interview to the Chinese media, and they were presumably uh, wrote the story in a particular way. But he described himself as somebody who didn't even know the words of the national anthem. And he wasn't a nationalist, but he had this dead end job. He was a security guard in a car park. Uh, he did the same job every day, he was a migrant worker, didn't know anybody, you know, no friends, bored out of his mind. Uh, just heard about the protest, went along, uh, got caught up, you know, lost control, kicked in the police gun, could happen to anybody. And then, so there was a painting a picture of a guy who, you know, was, you know, obviously described as a nationalist, had been taken a picture of as a nationalist, but really his issues were with his day-to-day -day existence and his daily life as a citizen of modernizing China. And obviously that's you know, a desperate worry for a Chinese Communist Party to have. And people like him, you know, are prepared to just kind of you know, chuck in their jobs in effect and, and join in a, in, a, in a riot, you know, poses a massive potential threat to the legitimacy of the party. So this is obviously a huge a big problem that the Chinese Communist Party has to manage and they need many different strategies of subtlety or not subtlety uh, to, to manage this. And I imagine that from you know, the perspective of somebody sitting in Beijing in a, in a party office, the internal threat is probably more worrying than the external threat. What does this mean? Um, I take um, from this I hope you have to stand back from this and you have to see what are the wider interests of the, the people running in China. Um, and this man is another uh, military speaker. Um, similar name to the other guy, he's Lui. He's a Yu Yuan, not Wo Yuan. Okay? Uh, I think it's his brother there. Also a general. But um, he's a, a, quite a well-known figure himself, also a uh, military aristocracy. Uh, he is the son of Communist China's first president, the new Shaoqi, uh, who was encouraged in the Cultural Revolution, but uh, the family will forgive him because he's back and he's a general. Um, he's been tipped, I don't think he's on it yet, but I think he's tipped for promotion to the Central Military Commission, which is the highest body in the army. Um, so he is uh, not um, someone who is irrelevant either. He is clearly uh, firmly in the, um, in the political and military establishment. Um, 
yet his intervention, or his most recent public intervention, has been basically to tell people to tell the horse to shut up. Um, and uh, his reasoning is quite clear. Um, he gave an interview to the Global Times, this newspaper was known as a hawkish newspaper, and said, China's economic development has been shattered by war with Japan twice before, but it absolutely must not be interrupted again by some accidental interest in any incident. Okay? And then he gave it to the TV interviews in which he repeated the same thing. So here you have somebody who is from the heart of the military establishment basically saying, shut up, we don't want war. And so why is he doing this? I think it's an attempt to get into widening the tiger, trying to manage public opinion. Um, and overall, it's the sense that the Chinese leadership recognizes that they are incredibly lucky, that their moment to, to grow comes at a time of almost unprecedented in, in Chinese world history. You know, we don't have any major wars going on, China's borders are threatened, except sense of the South China Sea or the, or the islands of the sea. There's, there's no Mongol horde opposed, poised on the borders of northern China. There's no nuclear confrontation with the Soviet Union going on. This is a, an incredibly lucky, lucky moment for the people of the China. That they can grow economically whilst not really having to face any significant external threats. And the longer that this period continues, the stronger China will get. And the phrase that's used in Chinese discussions of this is the period of strategic opportunity. And that was the title of uh, the general's article in the newspaper, Preserve the Period of Strategic Opportunity. We've got to keep this period of peace and cooperation going for as long as possible so that China can get as strong as possible before we get to a point where we can tolerate any kind of confrontation. I mean, the Chinese military is well aware that it is in no position to challenge certainly the US military or the Japanese military, or possibly even the South Korean military. And certainly you know, you know, some alliance of those three navies would completely smash the Chinese navy. Um, one only has to see the relative contributions of the different countries to the search for the missing amazing airline. I just dropped this in as I, I wrote an article about it a few couple of weeks ago. Um, the Americans deployed the world's most advanced maritime surveillance aircraft, the Poseidon P-8. The Australians, the New Zealanders, the Japanese, and the South Koreans deployed P-3 Orion search planes. The Chinese sent two transport planes and several pairs of binoculars. Okay? The Chinese Navy looks like a Navy, but it is not. Okay? They have had one year's experience of operating an aircraft carrier. Britain and the United States have had a century of experience of operating an aircraft carrier. It's the same with the Japanese. So, you know, the fact that it looks like a ship that is painted grey and has got a gun on it doesn't necessarily mean it can do what other country ships that look the same can do. And they know that. There's no way to get trying to go for war. Um, obviously, what the Chinese Navy has is power to intimidate, and certainly against uh, less well-armed neighbours, those of the Philippines, and what the Indians have had to be the greater. So, I take my basic conclusion is that, you know, based on the premise that the Chinese leadership isn't bad, that they know what's good for the country, and that peace and stability is good for the country. However, all options short of war are on the table. Um, so, threats, intimidation, blockades, sanctions, whatever else there is, these are all on the table and have all been used. You know, uh, deciding to stop Chinese tourists coming to the Philippines, stopping the import of bananas, and blockading the Second Thomas Shore. Uh, all of these things you know, fall short of war about all the methods, tactics that the Chinese government has used to advance its territorial claims in the South China Sea. Or so when I see that, it's going to be the future. That's what we're going to try and we'll do more and more. So you have a moment you have a sort of standoff at the second on the shoal, um, where you have a small detachment of Marines on a boat that's on a ship that's rusting away and at some point might break into you know that will fall into the sea. Um, and that's obviously what the Chinese are hoping because then the moment the Filipino troops pull off that shoal, then they will occupy it. 
the same way that they've done with uh, Scar Patrol. Hence the blockades, and I'm not actually open to fire on anybody really. They're going to try and stop the resupply of those Marines, and some of the Marines have to be pulled out. Um, and then if the Philippine side tries to, you know, bring in construction equipment or anything to shore the position, they're going to try and blockade that. So it's a kind of, it, it's a sort of everything short of war strategy. Um, but I think to try and go head to head with the Chinese military at this point would probably be disastrous for the Philippines. So there needs to be some kind of dialogue with the Chinese leadership about how to manage public opinion and the kind of things that I have to say and so forth. And almost as a sort of you know, we know what you're up to on this hawkish dialogue, but beyond this, we both have to sort this out. Um, and so my final point is sort of overlaps with the end of my previous talk is that. You know, what's at stake here is the Chinese sense that it owns the South China Sea. It has the historical right to own it. And that's where I think the dialogue has to take place. And I think, I think it'd be very difficult. But you know, given the disparity in forces, given the risks of confrontation and escalation, uh, that's 